Hey everyone, this is Malcolm with API Go. Thanks for tuning in. Today we've got a quick and dirty half hour podcast talking about the Biden administration and the ATF's new rulings on ghost guns. We're going to be filling you in on what you need to know, how it affects you, and Joe Biden's new nomination for the ATF director. So stay tuned. On a side note, we had some technical difficulties, so we had to use an alternate recording. So just turn up your volume and you should be fine. Thanks again. Uh, we're here today because we are somewhat pissed off and a little bit more pissed off. Yeah, uh, a little, a little angry, a little upset. Yeah, it's, it's it's another day in a democratic administration, which means uh, good things happen, and nobody likes guns. Yeah. So uh, today, Joe Biden, our commander in chief, announced that. He would, his ATF would be uh, bringing a rule change, which is essentially a law change, but with no accountability. Um, it's a mechanism by which the executive branch exercises too much power. Um, and he announced this rule change, which is related to 80% guns and non or what they call PMS now, privately manufactured firearms. Which means that if you've built a gun from the 80% kit, um, or 3D printed a gun, that way, to suggest people do. Um, you probably should pay attention because your legality probably hasn't changed, but uh, your ability to do that again may very soon. So, without yeah. further ado, the actual rule change itself is quite simple. Um, it is a bunch of obfuscated legalities that doesn't really mean anything, and I'm waiting for lawyers to interpret it. Uh, essentially, they've said that. You're not going to have to register your upper receivers. Uh, that's not a thing that's going to change. They're going to grandfather uh, rifle them to their definition change. But they've said, uh, essentially, they're going to be going on a case-by-case basis and deciding what to, uh, what, the, what uh, uppers will count as split or modular receivers, which is what they want to target, because they think that uh, more offers should be regulated. That's essentially the core of the rule change. Um, there are also some other uh, details about the process. For example, the process are actually going to be easier. And whenever an FFL uh, transfers to uh, which is legal, you can't build them for the purpose of selling, but you can sell them to an FFL. When that happens, they will have to serialize these others. Which, uh, we've already taken our policy, they just aren't part of it. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the kind of like hubbub and uh, justified anger to this comes from the fact that it's essentially a pretty much overnight change um, trying to regulate something that has, or I guess further regulate something that has been and that's always been legal. The idea of homemade firearms. Well, let's be clear, the American Revolution was one with homemade fire. Making your own gun, it's like brewing your own beer, or making your own moonshine, which is also illegal, even though everybody thought and does it. Uh, as Americans, it's good to You know, some members of Western Pennsylvania, but we don't talk about them. I am plenty of people in New York, but I think you're the stereotype in the South, they generally appreciate that. Yeah, um, but the interesting tidbit that I had heard was, you know, one of the main reasons that they're kind of pushing for this change is due to the fact that, you know, hope they're claiming that these homemade firearms, these uh, 80% firearms, are being proliferated within the criminal underworld, they're responsible for, you know, multiple shootings and numerous deaths. And some but, of that is some of that is true. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not without merit, but the <laughs> scale of it would be over exaggerated to an extreme degree. I believe 0.817 of them uh, recovered from crime case, not necessarily involving a shooting for a uh, or those guys, or unserial. With the un- Pennsylvania, that is it's at 1.5 percent. That's also because the JSCC wise in Pennsylvania that's why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I read that for New York, of the roughly 6,300 firearms confiscated, about 225 are these homemade guns. So, well, this uh, is New York, and it's harder to get guns here in general. Yeah, uh, so you're not so that's 3.5%. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're not going to see a lot of some of these cards this year. People have them, so either you're going to ship them from Pennsylvania, or probably it's going to be cheaper sometimes to get a eighty uh, percent. So by using the the phrase the go to of weapon of choice uh, to describe ghost guns, that's uh, I would rate that uh, mostly false. Uh, but that's, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's a that's a full four Pinocchio. I think maybe that would be appealing if you can't pass a background check. But honestly, I don't think that's a lot of the criminal people. I think that, or, or I think it might be a lot of people with the record who want to have a gun anyway, which I'm not willing to judge things like that either. Yeah. yeah. Like the idea that these homemade firearms that require more time and effort to actually make functional versus, you know, illegally purchasing a firearm from your local uh, gang or you know, that somehow that that's going to be easier. Let's well, be very clear that illegally acquiring a gun, I mean, this is an uh, And it's very, very hard to change the fact that it's uh, relatively simple to acquire a gun. Period. There's tons of them here. If you know somebody who can sell you weed, you can probably get a gun. You can have weed. Yeah. The, uh, the, idea, the idea is that it's really not that hard to break the law. Uh, what's that number that some people throw around? Five felonies daily? Yeah, um, so in terms of the actual rule change that came out today, it's really not very clear. Um, I'm generally good at reading legal documents, uh, and it's just a lot of ATF saying, we're going to decide uh, what we feel like defining on a particular day is a bad thing. So for our, for our listeners who are not familiar with any of this stuff or uh, the background of, of rulings for what is considered a firearm or what needs to be serialized. So, um, just to, just to like get it straight, um, it, it applies to 80% homes, right? It applies to uh, printing your own gun at home with 3D printing. Does it it actually to... does not apply to that. Okay. Uh, so, so existing 80% are essentially untouched. Okay. So it's only new ones if you decide to purchase one, I guess. Yeah, so 3D printing, so printing in general is clear. Uh, the frame of a, of a pistol is still the frame of a pistol. Uh, you can 3D print that, and you can buy the other parts. There's still no issue with that. Um, that's not a big deal. So then that means if you buy a, a billet of aluminum and you can see it, that's also... There was also specific language in the bill, in, in the rule change making it clear that billets would not be regulated. Gotcha. You couldn't have that bill. That's yeah. essentially the language they used in. Um, yeah. So, I mean, here are the questions about it. I, I just read the whole thing. I'm having trouble, like, you know, making it concise, but go ahead and just, like, give me your questions. So, is it true that having these 80% mowers forcing the, uh, the manufacturers of these 80% mowers to zero? Uh, sorry, you're cutting out. You're buying a new one. And a dollar something? I'm sorry, uh, you were cutting out, uh, for the half of that question. Oh shit, okay. Um, I was saying, so, not only if you're buying the 80% lower, uh, as a, as, like a new, uh, mm-hmm. like right off the shelf, but also if you're like transferring it to an FFL or something, they would, that FFL would then have to like serialize that lower, that re- lower receiver, is that correct? I believe they would only have to serialize it with finish. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, so they, they, the language again was not clear on this. Uh, they were not clear on it. They would redefine 80% lowers as firearms and that had to be serialized or if they just say that FFLs had to perform background checks on That was not made clear. Uh, they said that they wanted FFLs to perform background checks on 80% uh, or anyone who's selling them to perform background checks and have an FFL. Uh, but they didn't make it clear uh, how they would do that. However, if an FFL takes possession of a PMF of any sort, or any unserialized gun, they have to serialize it before they can sell it, and they have to serialize any unserialized PMF they have within stock uh, 60 days after the event the federal register. So, gosh. Sounds like a major pain. Yeah, a little bit. 
example. I don't have any good term. Are we clear yet? No, I'm not familiar with that one. Okay, so the FTP Foundation is an internet collective um, crowdsourced literature, essentially. And uh, in that universe, there's a villainous group known as Ari Puglia. Uh They are an anomalous art collective, and they make hazardous art. And the artfulness of it is that it is dangerous. So if you look at this painting for too long, your eyes will literally start to bleed. Or if you say, that's a nice painting, I'm not painting, your gut will fall out at midnight, three weeks after. You know, stuff like that. Uh, and so these, this group of nerds and hackers decided to start building guns, calling them art, uh, and 3D printing them. So what ended up happening is they sent a letter to the ATF, a comment, uh, arguing against this because it would infringe upon their freedom of expression. Uh, and the ATF took five pages of a 300 page document to respond to them and tried really hard not to laugh. It was really something to hold. Was it really cringy? Uh, they were being pretty professional about it, as they tried to do. Um, uh, they were, they were, I was not upset with how they were thought. Yeah. Except for the whole thing, but they argued it wasn't really an expression. A violation of that threat, which obviously it was. Yeah, wow, that's surprising they responded. Uh, well, I mean, one guy did write to the ATF, uh, he was, uh, literally to ask if he could attach a flashlight, uh, to the end of a rifle, or end of a short bell lift, and have a few points of the fix. Uh, and they answered, they answered by saying, we're not going to answer that to them, but think of us. Also, uh, well, this guy actually paid a lawyer, and he, the lawyer said, I'm writing to represent my client who wants to do X, Y, Z. Um, as far as I can tell, he is serious. So uh, I would ask that you treat this with the uh, whatever respect you feel it deserves. The one, the one thing that I was curious about: the ATF's decision to really have no weight in terms of legislation. Uh, I'm curious to see how this rolls into actual uh, legislation. What we're going to see once either the House or the Senators will react to it, what they're going to do, how are they going to, who's going to champion this bullshit, this is what I'm asking. And uh, well, we have our... The Democratic Party. Yeah. Of course, of course. Of course, we're going to have our, our normal players, but I'm just to if our, as a community, if any of our outrage will, will make a difference to those who will listen. Yeah, so uh, the, the problem with this is uh, this is a rating question. This is a pretty pre-determined pre rating question because traditionally support for gun control falls off. That's what it was going to be. Biden made a promise a year ago that he'd do some stuff on guns. He couldn't do it legislatively. Um, he did try that and it didn't go up. Um, and so now he'll be trying to get. Um, that's, then this is just, uh, I mean, I don't generally agree with executive measures in case you know how to no person in the right mind should. Um, but that, that, that's really all we're seeing here is that, um, that mechanism in action. Trying to do a promise to make comments and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. It, it seems pretty, uh, pretty evident of what their real intentions are. Um, as per, per course, like we, we already mentioned earlier, this isn't Crime. Um, it's just wasting everybody's time and effort and making it harder for all everyone else who's law abiding to be able to yes. So yeah, a lot of this is a lot of this like a lot of people who support this they they are they don't know better and I honestly believe many of them are acting in good faith. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and that's the really sad part is they don't know better. Yeah. It, it's pretty interesting. I, I think I brought this up a while ago when we were, we were just chatting. Uh, it's just like how the same people that will dismiss uh, any like contradictory opinion about like another hot button issue will say, "Oh, you can't have an opinion because you're not an expert, or you're not a scientist, or you don't know any better. You're just a, you're just a freaking normie, right?" But then these are the same people who don't probably have never shot a gun.
gun before or even held a gun before, and they're both blatant just blurting their opinions all over the place, uh, freely expressing their opinions about guns and acting like they're experts in gun control. So I think that's kind of hypocritical. Um, and one of the best things that people can do, whether they're you know pro-gun or anti-gun, is just to get informed and get learned. Exactly. And I think yeah, what we're doing right now and providing this, this you know this synopsis of information for our listeners is, is a good start. Well, yeah. let's run over some definitions in case we have some uh, some of the people from the greatest generation in the audience or somebody who's otherwise unfamiliar. And mm-hmm. they, yes. they have heard about those things. So, um, when a firearm manufacturer by trade makes them out of the U.S., they require or they're not required actually. They're required to call them serial. Uh, which means put a serial number on it, which is recorded when that gun is sold. Um, and that's, you know, it makes the gun traceable to some extent. Uh, so if it's stolen and used in a crime, or if it's used in a crime by somebody who legally purchased it, although that's really not, you know, one of the threat models that actually happens. Uh, you know, the investigation can show, you know, who bought that gun, or where, who was stolen from. Uh, so that's all, that's all that's really going um, you have to pass a background check to buy a serialized firearm from the dealer. Uh, and that rule is a change with unserialized firearms. You know, like, the rules still apply. Uh, it just means that if it's home built, it's probably not going to be serialized. Um, and building firearms at home is a thing that many people do. People have been doing it for uh, You didn't used to have to buy guns from a company. You go to the local gunsmith. Build one or you go to it or something. Um, that's the only thing how it works. But lately people have gotten better at it and doing it more and making crazier things than 3D printers, for example. Um, and so it's become a little bit of a hot button issue. And unfortunately it got too popular and uh, the fun things found out. Very simple. Uh, it's now getting harder to make your own firearm thing. Yeah. At, like on that note, it it amazes me how how much uh, media has kind of shaped uh, people's idea of what the process is like firearm. Um, I came across a scene today from the show The Ozarks. Or the Ozarks. In that scene. This one guy goes into a gun store and essentially commits a straw purchase. And all he does is he hands it a piece of paper with a specific model of firearm that he wants. And the clerk goes, oh yeah, here you go. Just sign your name and phone number and, you know, give me your cash. You're good to go. And on the, what I was assuming the producer stop was the 4473 or the version of it. Um, the clerk had looked at it and said, Oh, here you wrote that you're purchasing this not for yourself. You wanna you wanna change that, right? At no point if you were to ever go to a gun store and have any kind of indication that this purchase is any for anyone but yourself, would they allow you to go through with it? And be like, like, All right, you in need some states in some states you could uh show your skill carry and skip the portal that's true. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that's a thing. But yeah, uh, the media portrayal of buying a gun is hilarious. Especially if you watch Selling Sunny in Philadelphia when a couple of crackheads tried to do and fail. Because it's actually not the easiest thing in the world if you don't yeah. not commit crimes. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and Rap, you, you touched on it a little bit too about like, serialized the serial numbers. Why you know, news outlets, uh, you know, gun control groups are really, really like harping on that. And so, for listeners out there who don't know, or probably ask, why are serial numbers that important? Um, the answer is they're really not that important, really, uh, especially in terms of tracing the perpetrator of the crime. Because if you don't know, when you first buy, purchase that, firearm from a gun store, legally, you're not doing a straw purchase, <laughs> that firearm is not registered to your name. That's only registered to you. That's it. You're the first
first person to own that gun ever. If you ever decide to sell it, uh, you know, or transfer it to someone, or uh, give it to a to a family member, it's legal in your state. There's that trail, that record is now dead. So, and that obviously happens numerous times in inner cities and where crime is rampant and it's hard to get a firearm. That kind of transaction happens countless number of times. So, what does serial number really do? Not much. So that's kind of the like bullet points of what the serial number is like. What it even does? Like, why is if it's even relevant? Like. Really, yeah. The mythology of the traceable firearm is really quite amusing. Um, yeah. Like it comes to people who don't understand like how this actually works. Exactly. Yeah, but it's it's really not. Um, you can't do that much tracing on a gun. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, this local, I think Washington news outlet uh, interviewed an ATF agent uh, today about this new rule change. And even the ATF agent said, yeah, it doesn't really do that much. It's just one piece of the puzzle. So, you yeah, heard it from the, from the source. Um, so, yeah, so then you might, so some of might be asking, so now why are they so gung-ho about this? And that's exactly what that said. Oh, okay. For, yeah, it's just for points. Yeah, this is, this is essentially a nothing burger that makes an activity that a small amount of people in the population partake in slightly more. You're not wrong, though. Uh, but it's, it's really uh, it's an unnecessary, pointless, and not change anything. I don't think we're going to see any major differences in the number of unnecessary things in time. Yeah, crime's not going down, it's still trending up. Uh, and, uh, you know, also on scoring points with, with voters and polls. Um, on top of this rule change, uh, Biden is now, you know, pushing the new nominee for the ATF director. His name is Steve Dettelbach. Dettelbach. Um, he is a former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. Uh, he also ran for attorney general for Ohio, but lost. Oh no, he's from Ohio. Yeah, gross, right? Uh, <laughs> and, Ohio. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I just don't think people have, uh, he, he 
he didn't really have that many waves in the, in the political national, uh, you know, national like arena for for politics. I don't think you know, like I didn't know who this guy was. I don't think a lot of uh, pro gun people know who this guy is until you know, start digging stuff up and maybe stuff in the past will come to life. So we'll see. One thing, um, that could, one thing that actually can matter right now is since this is a midterms rating push, I would highly recommend writing to a Democratic congressperson if you have one and saying, yeah, this is a non-starter for me. I'm really not interested and I'm probably going to be voting Republican if you are uh, going for this guy. Because that's, that's the point. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's in the rating. Absolutely. And if it gets some bad rating, I mean, that's what they're afraid of. Raph, do you think that actually would work? Yeah, it could, we could absolutely turn it around against them. Hey, Raph, what do you think, uh, like, the impact is going to have on people? Yeah, um, so in terms of uh, stopping off today, let me, that, that's about it. The ATF rule change is worrying simply because it's so... Especially federal rules which are, you know, it's an interpretation. If they're saying, well, our interpretation is that we can interpret it more uh, whenever we feel like it, that's a really bad sign. Because it means that you might be doing something horribly wrong. According to yeah, exactly. So for those new gun owners out there, you're just getting uh, a nice little, little taste of how the ATF operates uh, and abuses their power of, of rulemaking. They should have close to none. Put it this way: if, you're, if you've ever been blamed for the actions of another person, especially as part of a group, uh, let's say, you know, hey, there's a stereotype or something like that. Well, welcome to the welcome to the club. Then you're simply going through that since you're small, nineteen, twelve or so, as you know, say, um, get used to it. It's just part of life. Uh, you'll be blamed for the actions of people who are not responsible. Yep, just goes with the territory. Uh, it really, truly sucks, and there is stuff we can do about it, but it's uh, a slow uphill battle. Does anyone have any final uh, comments? Well, the ATF stopped picking on it for a while ago, unfortunately. Um, well, I already said not going to stop me. Guys, I hope you guys say yours. Oh, yeah. Things I would recommend not doing is sending hate mail to the ATF to have a little bit of track record of doing things like burning 30 to 40 children at a time. Uh, so, maybe avoid you know, getting on their show. That's definitely not the wisest idea. Uh, yeah, no, I don't really have anything else to say. I'm just, uh, just here to get upset at the ATF and chew gum and I'm a lot of gum. Spread my feet, so. Well, I think that's a wrap for tonight then. A little quick yeah. little, uh, episode just to get updated on the news. Um, yeah, and for, uh, we'll, we'll probably have some more content coming out soon about Ghost guns, more more background information, probably a lot more stats and facts uh, on ghost guns. So just keep an eye out for that, guys. Um, but besides that, uh, I, don't, I don't really have anything else. Yeah, I'll be writing up a handy guide with everything you need to know. If you have something to help you to, I'll be consulting with some folks who know what they're doing to keep it within the bounds of the law. Um, I'd uh, appreciate it if uh, people looking into this didn't go to jail. So, please don't do anything stupid. Um, and if you do, don't post it on Twitter. So, we've been, we've been kind of, uh, out of pocket for a, for a little while, so, um, I just, I'll let everyone know that we're, we're frickin' back, and we'll be <laughs> j- having a lot more of these quick little sessions and more podcasts. We're gonna be posting a bunch of shit on social media, so, y'all just keep an eye out. It's gonna be good. Yeah, and if you want to hear about more stuff like this, we'll change. we will be uh, staying at the given up of that, but if you just want to like, keep a finger on the pulse of, you know, which things you do that are becoming illegal soon, uh, we're going to be doing our best to you know, keep that, uh, keep your prayers. Uh, because, you know, it's always good to know if you can make it all overnight. All right, uh, yeah, so I think that's pretty much everything we have for now. Uh, if anybody has any other items of note, all right. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.